Okay, good morning. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the Director of the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Thank you all very much for being here, uh, and happy August uh, to everybody. Um, we're really, really pleased to have everyone here today for what is actually the, uh, the third uh, in a new series that we've started here at, uh, at the CSIS Energy Program uh, called the Frontier Energy Series. Um, for those of you who are regulars here, you know that we spend a lot of time thinking about energy markets, energy policy. Uh, but one of the things that we've always sort of uh, quietly uh, prided ourselves on or tried to be conscious of doing more of was looking at issues of technology evolution, technology adoption, and the, uh, sort of the innovation cycle. Uh, and we think it's really important because uh, in terms of our public education mandate, it's really important to sort of understand what is it that is the ecosystem that makes sort of different technologies, different technology applications uh, succeed or fail, and how do we as people who think about policy and markets um, think about that process. Uh, and so we're really, really pleased uh, with the first session we had was on drilling technology. I know, totally thrilling, but it actually was very interesting. Uh, we recently also had the International Energy Agency in to talk about their energy technology perspectives, which is all about uh, the innovation process. And today, we're uh, especially pleased to have uh, the session on solar energy, which we've called adoption and marketability, to really look at what's happening in the field of solar, uh, how far have we come, how far do we have to go, uh, and what are both the innovations that are happening on the technology side of that equation, uh, but also in terms of uh, markets and financing uh, and a whole other thing, uh, range of things that we think are making solar an area uh, of, uh, that warrants increased attention. Um, I'm really pleased today to have Ethan Zindler here, who is not only the head of policy analysis at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, but a senior associate uh, with the CSIS Energy Program. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, these are smart pe people that we borrow uh, from time to time to help us uh, gauge uh, where we're heading and how we're dealing with an issue. And I can think of no better person uh, to have here today to sort of frame the discussion that we're about to have on solar than Ethan. And so I thank you very much for taking time out of your day uh, to do that. Uh, and Ethan has helped us put together a really wonderful uh, group of panelists who are going to help us deep dive a little bit deeper uh, into some of the various aspects of that uh, sort of energy technology ecosystem that I was talking about before. Uh, we've got Elaine Ulrich, who's the acting uh, team lead for the Sunshot Balance of Systems Soft Cost. I think that might be one of the longest titles in the world uh, uh, at the U.S. Department of Energy, but, it, but you know, it's good work, so good title. Uh, and uh, uh, next to her, we've got Yuri Horowitz, who's the CEO of Soul Systems, uh, and we'll uh, talk a little bit more about what they're going to talk about when we get to that uh, section. Uh, and then we also have uh, Nova Daly, who's the Senior Public Policy Advisor at Wiley Ryan LLP. Uh, and, uh, but he's uh, here representing Solar World, uh, and uh, so we've got like we said, three people who represent various aspects uh, of the, the, the sort of challenge and process that we're here to talk about today. So Ethan is going to go ahead and give uh, a bit of an overview presentation, and then we'll move into uh, comments uh, from the panel about how their world uh, uh, intersects with uh, some of the things that he, he'll tee up for us, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion. So thank you very much. Again, it's an on-the-record discussion, uh, and when we get to the Q&A, please wait uh, for microphones so that we can make sure that people who are listening online uh, are able to hear it. So without further ado, Ethan. Uh, well, first, thanks so much, Sarah. I'm really um, I'm honored to be part of this organization and take part in this uh, discussion here today. Um, and thanks, everyone, for making it, despite the um, supposed road, road closures and <laughs> insanity that was supposed to ensue, uh, thanks to the African Leaders Summit here. Uh, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to talk kind of broadly about um, where the solar market is today um, and then where we see it going. Um, and then talk about a few uh, potential uh, either obstacles or opportunities which I'm hoping sort of segue nicely into a conversation um, that we can have um, with, with each of our panelists. And, and thank, thanks to all of them for joining us as well today. So first, let me start with sort of the biggest big picture context here. You know, one of the main things that our firm, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, does is track investment in clean energy. So just to start us off, a little context, which is you know we've tracked over a trillion and a half dollars in new capital that's been invested in clean energy, and, and to be clear, my definition here is uh, a fairly narrow one of renewables, not even large hydro, not nuclear, not natural gas, but strictly a kind of narrow sense of new renewables uh, and biofuels and what we would call energy smart technologies. 
So the good news is you've seen this incredible rise uh, up to about $320 billion at one time of, of annual investment. Uh, in the last two years, total investment has actually been declining, um, although this year we think that we're going to th see things come back a bit uh, and probably go up a bit. But about a quarter trillion dollar per year in new capital invested in the industry last year um, overall. Let's see, if, does this work? Or does this work? That works. Um, so solar. Uh, with don't 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 strain your eyes trying to read each subsegment of this. But my point here um, is a pretty simple one, which is that as we turn the clock back, so our firm was founded in 2004 in London, um, and if you turn the clock all the way back then, um, for many of the quarters that we were tracking investment, wind uh, in the early days was attracting more money than the other technologies, and then you see biofuels also had its day. But if you look at the last several years, those yellow chunks, without, again, digging into the details here, those yellow chunks, chunks represent investment in photovoltaics for the most part, but also large-scale solar thermal. Um, and you can see how solar increasingly represents a larger overall share of total investment in clean energy. Now, in terms of where solar is going on, where photovoltaics are getting installed, um, this is just a quick glance, and I'm going to kind of keep peeking over this way where there's a screen, but this is just a, a quick glance at where the major markets have been. And first of all, of course, on an overall volume basis, you can see that we went from about six and a half gigawatts of capacity total uh, installed worldwide in 2008 all the way up to 40 uh, by 2013. So five times growth um, in, you know, about five years, uh, which pretty pretty amazing rate of growth. Um, but then as a sub-segment of this, important just to kind of look at where the markets have been and how they've been changing. The dark green bars at the bottom, um, that's Western Europe. And so you can see that, you know, 2008 through 2011 and even th 2012, um, the majority or close to the majority of the installations were taking place in countries like Spain and Germany uh, and elsewhere. And, uh, but that has dropped very dramatically uh, in the last couple of years uh, as, it, as an adjustment has gone on, particularly in Western Europe, uh, around feed-in tariff programs which support solar. In a number of cases, those have been scaled back or eliminated altogether. And the real growth markets, interestingly enough, have been Japan, um, in part, which you can see is the, uh, the orange chunk, in part in the sort of post-Fukushima age, as a lot of nuclear capacity, or all nuclear capacity was taken offline, they've gone through a major program to install more PV. Uh, and China, fascinatingly enough, uh, China had the biggest year we'd ever recorded uh, for new capacity installations last year. Uh, there are a lot of potential reasons for this, which we can get into, but China, for a long time, had been the largest producer, not a long time, but for the last several years had been the largest producer of photovoltaic equipment. It's also now the largest demand market for photovoltaics uh, as well. This is just a more optimistic forecast for us. I mean, frankly, this is one of the most impossible things to try to forecast. This market grows very, very quickly. Um, we tend to be pretty aggressive, and yet every time we think we're being aggressive, we undershoot the mark. So we always try to do both a, a pessimistic, or I'd say real, you know, pessimistic and optimistic perspective. Um, but we expect continued strong growth globally. And one last note on this sort of regional issue. That last top chunk is what we call rest of world. And that includes, obviously, a lot of things. But uh, a lot of it is the developing world. Uh, and what we're starting to see are a lot more opportunities for PV or photovoltaics in countries which don't have very large grids, um, but for whom solar can make sense on an economic basis to just go straight uh, to PV without building out massive hub and spoke kinds of grids. So this is just a quick glance at the U.S. market. Um, you know, this is our view on about uh, this year. We think we'll see about 4.6 to 5.6 gigawatts of capacity added. Um, we've broken it out by segment, um, by utility, commercial, and residential. Uh, and I, I think probably the most noteworthy as we look out on our forecast is in 2017, we expect um, basically um, the uh, the utility market to to be to well, potentially collapse because of the expiration of the U.S. investment tax credit, uh, which is so critical to the development of those projects. Um, looking longer term, actually, which is not on here, we do think the market will continue on its way. Um, uh, and this is one of my main points, which I'll get to, but uh, because we think solar is becoming economic without subsidies. I mean, we're really heading in that direction. In many cases, we've arrived there. Um, but that's sort of where we're going. Now, not uh, on the economics, uh, not 
all markets are created equal when it comes to the costs of photovoltaics these days. There are major differences between the cost of installing a solar system on your roof in California uh, and doing it in Germany. Uh, and that's sort of what we tracked here um, over time. Um, the different lines show the all-in CapEx, the cost of installation for a residential system uh, in different markets. Sort of as a baseline, that bottom line is the cost of a Chinese-made uh, multi-crystalline module. Um, but then as you work your way up, you can see different countries. And Germany really has been the world leader, you know, with a, at a cost of a bit over $2 a watt. Um, but then you can see above that some of the other markets, including, like I said, California, uh, which is probably more about, uh, about close to four, four to five dollars um, per installed uh, watt. So there are big differences uh, in terms of markets, and, and I think one of the things we're hoping Elaine will talk a little bit is sort of why that is. Um, uh, if everyone's buying you know, modules at, you know, yes, there's variations in module prices, but, um, but you know, the system costs at the end of the day are very different. Why, why is that? All right, now to the question of, of of uh, the economics of it and the cost competitiveness, and, and bear with me for just a moment on this um, chart. Um, what this is is a look at the levelized cost of electricity, that is the cost of generating power from your system, um, assuming that you want to earn a reasonable you know, um, rate of return on it, um, and how cost competitive solar can be in different markets. So along um, the bottom of the top axis, you can see the cost of power, and then the left to right axis is sort of uh, is a proxy for the level of sun. Um, let me back up and just say that there's really two things that go into making a determination of whether or not you should put a solar system, or two main things, let's say. One is how expensive is the power that you're getting out of the socket? And so how much do you save by offsetting that? And then two, how sunny is it where you live? So how much juice can you actually produce? So as you might imagine, if you live in a market where it's very expensive to buy electricity, and it's very sunny, well, that's, that's a place right now, I could probably tell you with some degree of certainty, economically it makes sense for you to put a PV system on your roof if you can get it financed. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of gray areas, places where electricity is very expensive, but it's not very sunny, places where it's very sunny, but electricity prices are very low. So this is just sort of a look at where we are now. The 2014 line tra tracks what we call our levelized cost of electricity for PV right now. And the markets that are essentially above that, by our view, again, is sort of a theoretical construct, but I think it's important, it can make sense right now for the consumer to put a PV system on their roof, given the cost savings that they can enjoy based on, again, the electricity prices that they may be paying and are offsetting, and the level of sun where they live. Um, and as, as the price of solar comes down, which is that 2020 curve line, more markets are going to become uh, you know, viable economically. And again, this is an analysis, just actually for the first time, this is an analysis that is not including subsidies. This is stripping out subsidies and saying what's competitive, what's not. Uh, another way to look at pricing is to look at the actual contracts that are being signed for photovoltaics. Um, we track the power purchase agreements that get signed for large projects. We're now not talking about Residential, we're talking about um, utility scale here, and you can see that the cost, the PPA prices come down all the way to a, a $50 um, uh, per megawatt hour PPA that was signed uh, in Texas. Uh, one thing to note here, of course, is that if you uh, are the developer who, who owns that project and you sign that PPA, you are going to benefit from the 30% investment tax credit. So that allows you to sign a bit lower PPA and still earn your rate of return. So this is not what we would call an unsubsidized analysis. This includes the thought and the consideration of subsidies. Now, <clears throat> turning the lens, sort of looking forward, you know, our view is that there's a lot of great opportunity for this market and that prices are going to continue to decline. And this is going to continue to play a, a, a much larger role uh, in the overall uh, energy ecosystem. Um, so, you know, 2010, about $4.64 was the global average that we were tracking for residential capex. That's the cost per watt of solar. Uh, uh, we've seen that drop down 2013, 2014 to 275, 262. This is a global number. Obviously, it's more expensive than California, as I mentioned before. Um, but, you know, we think prices are going to continue to get reduced um, as costs get squeezed out, um, in part by the technology, but also a big part from the non-technology costs, which I know Elaine can talk a bit about as well. Uh, and in terms of our long-range view, 
look, we've got our long-term perspective. Many people do. 2030 is a long time away, so I, I put that out there as the caveat. But we're very bullish that we'll continue to see strong PV growth. But it's worth noting that if you look at a market, if you look at a global energy market in terms of demand for, for overall electricity, let's say that more or less doubles from 2012 to 2030, you can have PV take up a very large share of the annual new capacity installations, which is the middle chart. And you'll still end up with only, no, I say only, but you know, with 18% PV um, by the time we get to 2030. So while we may be very bullish on the growth of PV, uh, our firm in terms of our long-term outlook and, and modeling, um, we're also realistic that there's going to be, it's certainly not going to completely displace fossil generation anytime soon, that there's a big world out there. And as long as the you know, economy keeps growing globally and that we keep having more demand for energy, um, that there's going to be room for a lot of different technologies to grow. We do think PV will be the strongest one to grow, given what we're seeing on the cost side um, and some of the implications in developing countries. Uh, but that still leaves plenty of room for other technologies. Okay, so, um, and I'll finish up in just a moment, but what are some of the things, so that's a very nice, happy picture of uh, falling costs, cost competitiveness, economic competitiveness, long-term opportunity. What are some of the things that are potentially, let's say, short-term obstacles um, to further um, growth? So a couple I'll cover here. Um, one, you know, in some cases, some strong uh, opposition to PV uh, that's coming from various incumbent players, uh, in particular some utilities. Um, two, if we don't hit our goals or if we don't, you know, bring our costs down as quickly as, as could happen. And three, um, the potential impact of trade disputes. So I'll take those sort of one at a time here. So first, um, if you take your mind back for just a second to that chart that I showed earlier and said, and, and just hold on looking at this for one sec, um, we, we thought about for a second, again, what was it that made residential photovoltaics cost competitive? A big part of it is the cost of the electricity that comes into your house, the, the, how do you, you know, the socket electricity that you get. Now, uh, in Europe, in a number of cases, the total cost of electricity that a consumer buys has been very much impacted by taxes and fees. In particular, if you look Germany here, it's about a 50-50 split on what the consumer is paying between the two of those things. So if you raise electricity prices, obviously you make PV more, uh, more cost competitive. Uh, now this is not, um, frankly, this is a message that has not gone unnoticed by a number of U.S. utilities who are concerned about um, potentially, essentially losing um, market share uh, to PV. Uh, and so in a number of markets around the country, and I think maybe Yuri can talk a little bit about this from the, from the installer perspective, um, a number of conversations have begun to take place about the implications of the rise of solar and should there be some kind of fee that's imposed on solar homeowners to take into account the cost of having 24-7 power even though a PV system only provides it you know, when the sun is essentially shining. Um, this is an ongoing discussion in a number. It's taking a lot of different forms around the issue of net metering, about fees and other kinds of things, but it's an issue that's starting to take place and, and we'll see how a lot of it plays out. The second thing is around technology. Um, I showed that nice sort of projection out that we've got for costs coming down. Um, but part of that is contingent on the fact that we're going to continue to see technology improvements um, and that we're going to continue to see the costs of the equipment continue to come down. Um, and that is, uh, to some degree, reliant on investment um, from venture capital and private equity, which is what this is a quick look at. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a flattened chart, but my, my main point is that if you look back to 2007, 2000, particularly 2008, in the great sort of heyday of venture capital investment in photovoltaics, there was a tremendous amount of interest in all kinds of new technologies that would potentially change the world. Um, I have to say, the only interesting sort of fallout of all of that is that actually one of the sort of least sexy, least sort of exciting technologies is the one that seems to be prevailing, which is basically making uh, photovoltaics out of sil silicon um, and just doing it at bigger and bigger scale and driving that cost down. But there was a lot of investment in, in different types of, of um, technologies. The level of that investment, though, in new technologies has definitely declined as we go into the last couple of years. Uh, and in fact, even though we've seen a kind of nice uptick of investment in venture capital investment, um, a good deal of that now is starting to go into those uh, companies like Yuri's who are installers um, and are getting out there and doing the systems um, who don't necessarily represent a sort of technology play. Now, let me be clear, that's okay. 
because if you go back to a few slides, I showed you before, we're at about maybe 450 or $5 a watt to do solar in California. Well, if the module, the actual module, costs you know, well under a dollar a watt, that's only a fifth of that total cost. So that leaves, let's say, maybe three or four dollars of costs from all kinds of other things, applying for the permits, getting the guys up on the roof to put the things up there, all that stuff. There's a lot, the financing, of course. There's a lot of room for reducing that cost as well. Uh, and so we hope that we'll see more of that. And I know Elaine will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then finally, there's the issue of um, trade. And maybe before I even talk about this, just to put this in a little bit of context, um, look, uh, you know, our firm's been around for 10 years. And in the past five years in particular, the amount of sort of trade conversations that have gone on has grown. I don't know. I, I, we you can't track it sort of in any kind of quantitative way, unfortunately. But um, there are many countries around the world that have various forms of trade policies. In some cases, they represent tariffs. Um, in other cases, and in a number of cases, they represent so-called domestic content rules, where they simply require that the, that the photovoltaic equipment that gets installed in that country get manufactured in that country, or some percentage of that. So countries as diverse as South Africa, or Turkey, or Brazil um, have all had various types of domestic content rules, and others as well. So this is an ongoing issue. And I think uh, one thing to sort of keep in mind on the, the, the and I'm certainly aware that it's a controversial issue, is that um, you know if you go back to those charts that I showed earlier, we think we're sort of in the second or third inning of solar, and there's a lot more growth to come. Um, and so you could make the argument that from the long-term perspective, there needs to be lots of manufacturing hubs around the world. And it's not crazy for individual countries to try and create their own hubs where they're going to be serving those markets, again, whether it's Brazil or Turkey or the US or wherever. Um, but on the other side, one of the arguments that we, of course, heard is that if you drive up the price of solar through these kinds of tariffs, you potentially can reduce the rate at which you're going to have adoption and deployment. So I put that out there. I know that this is an issue that's of, of, of enormous interest to a lot of folks. So in terms of, and, and I think Nova certainly can talk more when, he, when we get to him in a bit about sort of the specifics on the US-China trade um, relationship. Um, and I won't walk through each individual sort of aspect of this other than to say that um, there's been a couple rounds now, or several rounds now, of tariffs that have been imposed by the US on Chinese-made um, equipment, uh, prompted largely uh, by uh, by a case brought by Solar World, which is a manufacturer uh, which is headquartered in Germany but has manufacturing operations in the United States. Um, and in the short run, uh, the, the, the immediate tariffs in 2012 um, essentially uh, put a certain kind of tariff in, in, in one channel of, of distribution into the United States, but created the opportunity for Chinese module makers to source their cells from Taiwan and get the cells, put them into the modules in China, and then send them to the US um, and avoid tariffs. Uh, the latest round of tariffs seeks to address that. And again, I won't get into too many details on it, other than to say that there's a lot of different paths sort of into the United States for different types of manufacturers. And frankly, we read the, the decision that came down the other day, and it's, it's complicated to think about these different kinds of paths. Um, but the bottom line is our view, without maybe going through all of this, is that we anticipate that Chinese manufacturers are going to continue to try to export to the US. Um, and uh, more likely, they'll choose the path now of a direct integrated supply chain out of China um, and potentially uh, incur what would be roughly a 31% in many case um, tariff when they arrive here. Um, now, now, the big question is, what does that mean for the overall you know, uh, impact of the US market? A couple things to keep in mind, if you go all the way back to that chart that I showed, the U.S. market represents roughly a bit under 10 percent of the global market in the U.S. So we're an important market, but we're not the most important market. We're not the biggest market. So there's a lot of capacity out there that can come into this country through different uh, routes. So one thing to note from the manufacturer's perspective. Um, the second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at a total cost of 4 to $5 a watt, and you're talking about a module cost of under a dollar, you know, by our estimate, if you add, let's say, 18 cents onto that, that's obviously going to make the cost higher. But it's on a percentage basis against 4 to $5 a watt is not that high an overall impact. So that's sort of our short-term take on it. But like I said, I hope we, as we have the conversation around trade, I think the real question is about the question of sort of short-term issues around building manufacturing hubs in different parts of the world and what the value is 
for that, and then the longer term view um, as well. So I think that's just about it. And I just say thanks very much to Sarah and hand it back to her. Thanks very much, Ethan. So there's a lot, uh, a lot in the introduction. What we should do now is maybe spend a little bit of time digging down deeper into various aspects of, of what Ethan talked about. Uh, I'd like to start with Elaine, if we can. Um, again, acting team lead for the Sunshot Balance of Systems Soft Cost uh, Program at the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, Elaine's going to talk a little bit about uh, what you do at the Department of Energy to think about solar issues more broadly, and then particularly what your specific challenge is or opportunity, I suppose, uh, is in the work that you're doing. So thanks, sure. Elaine, for being here. Thanks for having me here, and uh, thanks, Ethan, for all that awesome information. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm here again. I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot Initiative, and for those of you who are not familiar with Sunshot, um, it's a program that was, it was a presidential initiative that was started um, under then Secretary of Energy uh, Chu, basically to help drive the cost of solar energy into a realm where it was cost competitive with conventional energy sources. And so the cost target there was six cents a kilowatt hour, uh, basically for a utility scale solar. And so um, we're about three years now into this, uh, this decade long challenge that was going from 2010 to 2020. And uh, you know, in that we had cost targets for the hardware, for the soft costs, for grid integration. And um, on the hardware side of things, we've been doing really, really well. As, as Ethan was mentioning, um, the costs of the hardware have dropped very, very rapidly over recent years. And so um, you know, now what we have in front of us is, is a challenge to, uh, to continue to, to drive those markets here in, in the United States for grid-tied electricity. And so uh, within the SunShot Initiative, we have five sub-program teams. We work on both photovoltaic technologies as well as concentrating solar power. Um, so those are what I would refer to as PV or CSP technologies. We also have a systems integration program that works on all of the power electronics, the systems components, uh, grid operations. And then we have a manufacturing innovations group and then the balance of system soft cost area. And that's basically everything else. And so as, as Ethan was mentioning, that encompasses everything from your permitting, your financing, training and workforce development, uh, as that gets to the, the installation costs. Um, and so you know, we, we cover all of that. We also help to work with a number of, of leaders, folks who are working on policy and regulatory aspects, provide them with high quality analysis and things like this. Um, and, and so, you know, we're really kind of a soup to nuts shop when it comes to looking at doing both the technology development as well as the integration and uh, looking at the aspects and how we can support those who are looking to deploy uh, these various technologies. But, uh, you know, it, when I really look at, at where we're at and, and, you know, some of the recent analyses that we've had done, you know, what we're seeing is well over um, half of the cost of a solar installation is not tied up in the hardware. And so, you know, I know that there's a lot of news in, in recent, uh, you know, recent months in the, in the past year about things like smart inverters, about storage, about, you know, all these various things that can potentially, um, you know, have big impacts and, and change the way that this technology is deployed. But the bottom line is that for any of these things to work, you have to have a well-functioning market that values whatever they're bringing to the table. And so, um, you know, there's your straight kilowatt hours, the electricity that's coming out of a solar system or, you know, another renewable energy source. Uh, but there's also other aspects to managing the grid, and I think Ethan was, was you know, uh, talking a little bit about this, uh, you know, making sure that you have that, that power surety, you know, what we call volt and var support and things like this, um, power conditioning. And, you know, increasingly there is technology that can do those kinds of things, but valuing those services uh, in the marketplace is going to be an increasingly important aspect of what happens there. And so, um, you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm very excited about, you know, all the technology developments that are, that are going on, but I also think that there's a lot of work that we need to do on supporting well-functioning markets and putting in place the kinds of mechanisms that, uh, that can value all those various kinds of services that are happening in the grid. Um, and again, utilities argue that those are important things to do, and the question is who will be the various players that do those things. So um, I think another part of that, and a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing recently in balance of system soft costs, um, has been around the recognition that, again, since soft costs are not inherently hardware related, essentially what those have to do with are, you know, people needing information. And uh, so the great news about that is that we live in a digital age. We live in an information age. And so um, when you look at 
algorithms, computing capacity, these are all things that we can get very much better at really, really quickly. And so uh, that, that means that uh, there's a lot of great potential to drive those costs down really, really quickly by you know, relying on investment in some of the areas where the U.S. has been very, very strong in, uh, in, in, the, in the past in investing you know, in venture capital and things like this. And you know, just as a sort of an anecdote about this, I was, I was talking to one of our national lab analysts last week, and he was indicating um, that you know, he'd, he'd been talking to some folks in the West who are working on the energy imbalance market there. And so um, California has an independent system operator, the California ISO, that uh, manages the electricity grid for California, and uh, they have a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of sort of creep into uh, some areas outside of California where they're uh, where their energy market uh, operates. But they now are starting to be involved in and, and put together a, uh, a, this energy imbalance market that will allow them to interact with other markets in the West. And so as that work has been going on since uh, last year, basically uh, Pacific Core has started to use the various algorithms and do more of that real-time, you know, five-minute pricing um, to, to practice what it will be like when they integrate into that energy imbalance market. And even though uh, Pacific Core is not yet working with California, is not yet integrated into that larger um, balancing region, they're already seeing savings just by using the improved algorithms, the improved software that California has. So they're already seeing that they are having more efficient dispatch just from using better quality software. And so that, to me, again, is really exciting, and I think that that's a, a, a really critical piece. So um, again, I think in general, some of the, the exciting things that we're doing um, in Sunshot are you know, really having an, an increased focus on some of the work that we're doing on um, systems integration, on uh, building up infrastructure data assets, on uh, supporting software development and things like that. And then along with all of that, there's, there's actually also a social science piece. And so we have a really exciting um, new program that uh, we launched just last year that is called Solar Energy Evolution and Diffusion Studies. And that is a program that is supporting um, bringing together big data scientists, social scientists, and on-the-ground practitioners who are using tools like randomized control tri trials to improve de deployment programs. And so by pulling those three pieces together, we can really quickly iterate and figure out what works in the marketplace uh, in a much better fashion. And so um, that, that for me is also, I think, uh, a pretty exciting development from the kinds of things that we've been doing. And I think it's a, it's a great a great place for us to be working on, on doing um, de development that you wouldn't necessarily um, see happening in an organic way otherwise. So, um, you know, between that and then I think the other area where, you know, I, I put a lot of my focus is on just increasing access to solar through new business models, things like shared and community solar, um, focusing on improving access to financing and things like this. I think that, that also has made a huge difference and that there's, a, you know, the opportunity to have very rapid uh, you know, changes in, in how we're, we're uh, reducing the cost there. I think that, that will make a big difference. But one point that I wanted to make, um, Ethan, is that, you know, as you were going through, you were quickly sort of switching between using the term cost and price. And so I think that's, that's one really critical thing to note about the U.S. market, is that the price of a solar installation is not necessarily um, closely pinned to the cost. And so there are certain markets that um, where I would say you know, costs are, are relatively similar, or in some cases, um, you know, the costs may actually be higher in some markets, but the prices may be lower. And uh, again, that has a lot to do with what the prevailing market will bear and, you know, consumer education, to be frank. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that, uh, you know, we can provide more transparency in the marketplace as well for American consumers. So that way they can go in there in an educated manner. And, and when I'm talking about consumers, I'm not just talking about, you know, individuals who are trying to do residential programs, but again, those leaders, folks who are working with utilities, commissions, policymakers to understand, um, you know, what the economics really can look like for them. So. Thank you, Elaine. Um, and I'll have a follow-up question for you when we sort of circle back. Um, uh, so now I think, Yuri, we'll skip over you for a minute and go to Nova, if that's okay. Uh, Nova Daly, uh, uh, 
actually an international investment and trade uh, specialist, but here representing uh, the views of somebody that you work with closely, Solar World, who Ethan has sort of talked about. Um, tell us a little bit about the company, about uh, sort of the, uh, the perspective on sort of the challenges and opportunities that come with the, the sort of changing solar market from the Solar World perspective. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, uh, CSIS, and Ethan, for having us here. Um, well, uh, first, a disclaimer. Uh, my, my comments don't represent Solar World, uh, nor the, do they represent my uh, law firm, Wiley Ryan. They are my own, so they should be attributed to me. Uh, that said, a little bit about Solar World. So it's uh, obviously, uh, as uh, has been talked about here, it's a German company. Uh, that decided to come to the United States uh, and in, has invested about $650 million of its own money uh, to make and produce solar here in the United States. Why? Because at the time it made perfect economic sense. Polysilicon is widely supplied and made here in the United States. Labor is a very small part of manufacturing and the equipment uh, is going to be uh, market, uh, market prices. So it made sense given the expanded U.S. economy and expanded market for solar in the United States to come here, build it here, uh, and continue to expand. Uh, what it faced uh, was a very difficult problem. Uh, starting in about in 2008, uh, China, uh, through its uh, five-year plans, decided that solar uh, power was one of the industries that it needed to ramp up on. Uh, so its first five-year plan, 2006, and then its subsequent five-year plan, uh, it made the expansion of solar a priority for its market, and it did uh, very well to do that, uh, expanding uh, its exports into the United States within the period of 2008 to 2011 or 12 by about 1,700 percent. So the effect was about 20 U.S. businesses shutting their doors in the United States uh, and many innovative industries uh, losing the ground to be able to innovate here in America. Uh, Solar World was, uh, like the other industries, uh, very much on the brink, uh, on the brink of uh, losing out not only here but in Europe uh, as China expanded its uh, exports. Uh, it's a good thing to expand exports and develop uh, technologies, but when you do it at such a rate, uh, if it's not controlled, it creates bubbles, and we know what bubbles do to economies, especially when they're driven by subsidies from a state, production subsidies. They eventually burst, and that's what uh, uh, happened in the solar market. Uh, so uh, Solar World had very little recourse but to take uh, the actions uh, that were legal uh, and available to it. And one of those actions was to file trade cases with the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, now, I have to make clear that these trade cases, I mean, it's U.S. law, it's international law. When China ceded to the WTO uh, in 2001, one of the obligations it took on was Article 6 of the GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and that it would understood, and it understood, that uh, the rules are that dumping and providing subsidies, uh, certain subsidies, export subsidies, uh, uh, into a market that causes injury uh, can allow those uh, foreign uh, producers to file cases and grievance upon them. The important part of understanding the tariffs is not, they're just not willy-nilly tariffs that the Department of Commerce decided to put up. It goes through a very rigorous process of looking at uh, the cost practices of the foreign producers. It goes on site, uh, opens the books and, and accounts. Uh, it talks to the foreign governments to find out the subsidies being provided. But that's half the equation to determine what level of dumping or subsidy happened or occurred. The other part of it is, you can do all that dumping and subsidization as much as you want, but it has to actually injure the U.S. market to be considered WTO illegal. Uh, and that's what has been found nine times on the Chinese producers. So uh, the net effect uh, is that tariffs have been put in place, uh, as Ethan has uh, uh, sort of uh, demonstrated. But if you look at sort of shipments from China, uh, you know, uh, they do go down after uh, the initial filing of the first cases in 2011, uh, but then they eventually picked up because within the scope of the first case, uh, there was a hole that allowed Chinese producers to essentially uh, take their wafers that were produced in-house from polysilicon produced in country, and then take it to Taiwan uh, to have it further manufactured into a cell, and then bring it back to China to produce a wafer that was suddenly out of the scope. Uh, 
that wasn't addressing the injury that was still occurring to uh, Solar World and uh, the supporting uh, coalition behind it that includes 250 employers and over 25,000 employees. Uh, so they determined that a subsequent case uh, needed to be filed to address this uh, loophole uh, in the first case. Uh, so the preliminary findings have come out uh, recently uh, on the dumping side and the subsidy side and additional duties have been put in place. Uh, but the end goal uh, uh, for Solar World and the members of the coalition has always been uh, to have a U.S. market uh, that is fair and equitable and based on competition that is not WTO illegal. Uh, that's the end goal. Uh, because I think all companies agree that given that level playing field, uh, you are in a position to compete fairly with the best innovations and the best uh, cost pricing as you can. Uh, some interesting studies I came upon in terms of uh, representing Solar World are just, you know, the Renewable Energy Lab at the Department of Energy came out with a study and found that it actually produ uh, costs, costs less to produce and ship uh, solar in the United States. Uh, that is because of what I said earlier on the polysilicon equipment. Uh, so U.S. producers ought to have a comparative advantage to make this product, ought to have a comparative advantage. Uh, and given that, I think there's some justification, at least from the legal side, for filing cases in order to build that level playing field. Um, you know, on the economic side, uh, uh, do, do these trade actions, do they inevitably uh, produce a situation where you have the things you want to have for the Department of Energy, innovation happening in the United States uh, uh, and the globe, uh, and the expansion of renewable energies like solar and wind? Uh, well, I think they do. Uh, I think they create uh, uh, a level playing field whereby other producers can come in, and it's been very interesting. One of the uh, supporters of our trade case, Helios, uh, recently was bought out by a Chinese producer that's now going to manufacture in the United States. Uh, 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 Solar City has gone and decided to do manufacturing in New York. So I think in the end, what you always want to create is a market without distortions and a market that allows for a competition and innovation to drive, uh, to drive progress. Uh, one of the more fascinating stories I came across in sort of my research in, in, uh, in, in working on this case and the cases uh, with Solar World and the Coalition was, was a story of uh, uh, what happened in the 1980s. Um, Ronald Reagan essentially uh, did a 301, which is a trade action against uh, Japan in, re in regards to semiconductors uh, that were being uh, shipped into the United States while Japan had barriers and didn't allow uh, 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 semiconductors to go into its market. Uh, it was pretty controversial at the time, uh, but he was able to negotiate an agreement where, whereby Japan sort of slowed its shipments. It gave uh, a new playing field for U.S. producers to have sort of a breather from the onslaught of dumping that was occurring. Uh, three years later, a company that was near the brink and teetering uh, discovered a new technology called the Pentium chip. You know the company, it's Intel. Uh, and that company has uh, driven some of the great innovations in semiconductors and driven down prices. So uh, the end goal, uh, I think, in trade uh, and in industry is to make sure you don't have distortions, uh, temporary distortions that level and take away uh, from the marketplace uh, players that could have otherwise brought great innovations uh, and great new uh, capabilities to expand solar and renewable energy, which I think is a good thing. So that said, thank you so. Thanks very much, Nova. Uh, we'll move on to Yuri Horowitz, who is here uh, representing the, uh, he's the Chief Executive of Officer of Soul Systems uh, to talk about the, the sort of uh, installer and uh, financing perspective. And sort of good segue, because speaking of innovation, a lot of what has happened in the market is sort of innovating on how you actually get these products you know, out to people, out to different markets. Uh, and there's a lot of innovation going on on that side as well. So, Yuri, thanks for being here today. Sure. Um, and just a footnote, I'm, I'm, we are not an installer. We're um, a financier. Um, so hopefully you guys will still welcome my comments. But <laughs> uh, first, maybe a personal story. Um, I, I'm not a, a, a policy expert. I'm, I'm pretty informed on the industry. I'm, I've been a CEO of Soul System since 2008. I started the company. And I've been in solar and wind uh, really since I can remember. I uh, studied it throughout college and law school and then did renewable energy law and then started the company, as I said, in 2008. I think um, what I've seen in my journey is an industry that's exciting. Uh, it's exploding. 
Um, and I think it's got real promise for the future, and I want to touch upon why I think that is um, through maybe some, some stories and, and also through just a, a couple bullets. The first is um, solar fundamentally changed in the early 2000s with the innovation called third-party financing. Uh, uh, it's, it's really the core of most companies now that install uh, solar, solar projects throughout the United States. Uh, Sun Edison, Sun Power, Solar City, uh, if these names ring a, a bell to you because you study solar or you're involved in it at all, all of them are really a function of the third-party financing uh, revolution. And I think that was the first change in solar that really started what is currently a, a multi-billion dollar market and will soon be a trillion dollar market in the, the global context. So I'd say that was the biggest change early on in solar that's really um, driven a lot of the companies to grow as they are. I remember when we started our company, uh, we're based here in D.C., uh, we're about 30 people. Um, we started in my dining room, working from my dining room table. Um, last year, we were the 91st fastest growing company in the United States, and um, we've grown tremendously from two people to, to what we are now. Uh, but when we first started, there were a bunch of other kind of smaller companies out there as well, a company called Astrum Solar, um, which is located here in Maryland. Uh, which was recently purchased for $54 million from Direct Energy. Um, that's, a, that's a narrative that I think demonstrates how the industry's grown since we began, and, and in part, in large part, Astrum uh, is a function of that third-party um, innovation. What that means is that oftentimes customers cannot afford the upfront cost of solar. Um, that was very true throughout the 2000s. Uh, solar projects or systems are still fairly expensive, as Ethan pointed out earlier, especially for homeowners. Um, what the third-party financing uh, mechanism and innovation did was enable uh, homeowners and, and businesses often to uh, secure solar for no upfront cost and then pay what is often the lease payment or a power purchase uh, uh, payment on a monthly basis for the power that the energy, the power the solar system produces. So I think um, that was the first innovation that really changed uh, where we are today. The second, for better or for worse, is exactly what uh, Nova was just talking about, which is the entrance of uh, the Chinese as well as Philippine uh, markets, as well as Taiwanese markets and others, um, basically bringing down module costs significantly. So another story, I remember sitting in uh, our, our middle room in my apartment when we first started the business. and. Uh, hearing about this company called Canadian Solar that was selling solar uh, modules for $2 a watt. This was about 2009. That was groundbreaking at the time. Most solar uh, modules cost $250, um, sometimes more, certainly. Uh, Sun Power was more than that. Um, Canadian Solar was a Chinese company. They had uh, decided to use the name Canadian Solar for many obvious reasons, but um, they were shipping modules in for $2 a watt. Those modules now are 65, 75 cents. And those are from competitors that are as good, if not better, than Canadian solar. That's a span of about five years between 2008 and 2013 when modules went down that quickly. Some of it was because of dumping. A lot of it was because of scale uh, and new markets. And that's the third point, which is um, people often say, well, you know, is solar a function of U.S. market um, gluttony, basically, from the government, um, RPS, um, schedules, renewable portfolio standard schedules, um, the federal ITC. Yeah, sure, solar's been built on the back of federal subsidies just like any other energy source. But to think today that solar is a function of the federal investment tax credit or state RPS schedules is a fallacy. Uh, it's a big one. Uh, solar in the United States, if we're lucky, we'll do six gigawatts of solar, which in and of itself is huge. Uh, I'll use another story. In 2008, when we started, there was about 300 megawatts of solar getting built every year in the United States. In 2013, there were three gigawatts being built, and this year we think there will be about six gigawatts being built. That's 6,000 megawatts or 6 million kilowatts of projects. There's a solar system that goes in the ground every four minutes in the U.S. It's an explosive industry, and that scale is beyond the United States. Uh, the U.S. is going to do about six gigs, as I said. Uh, China and Japan will be doing between 10 and 15 gigs um, in the 14-year 14, uh, 14 uh, as Ethan, I think, showed you earlier on the, the chart. So solar is beyond the U.S., and that's the, the, that's the third um, point beyond the first, which is third-party financing, the second, which is technology cost. The third is market expansion. If you have scale in the U.S., that's a good thing. If you have scale globally, that's a huge thing, and I think that's where we are with solar. The fourth, and I think this is really a 2014 innovation, 
is the increase in public market participation in solar. Um, one of the slides earlier demonstrated or uh, illustrated uh, the reduction in uh, VC funding for solar. Well, part of that huge reduction in VC funding is because VCs are primarily in the United States, and in 2008 and 2009, they were primarily investing in solar modules. And in 2009 and 2010, the Chinese decided to destroy the U.S. solar module market. Um, and they, they did so pretty effectively. Whether that's, uh, you know, good for the industry or not uh, is a discussion I, I'm not going to entertain. But um, what ended up happening was VCs didn't really know how to invest in other types of companies. VCs invest in widgets. They don't invest in financial companies like our own that connect uh, Fortune 500 companies with the solar market. Uh, they invest in companies that innovate modules or racking uh, or uh, inverters. And frankly, this wasn't the country where that stuff was getting built affordably. So I wouldn't argue that the, the, the decrease in VC funding for solar isn't a huge downside to the solar market overall. I would just say it's a change in where the different parts and components of solar are being built. Financing still takes place in the United States. The biggest investors still happen to be U.S. companies, um, companies like MetLife, U.S. Bank, um, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, all are very active in solar. We know because we, we work with many of them, nationwide insurance companies, a client of ours. Um, and so I think where the change is in 2014 is in things called yield codes, for any of you guys that follow solar, or securitizations. And uh, that's fundamentally what's changing the, the nature of solar now. Um, and it's changing because uh, where is the cost of capital in other words, the cost to access to finance solar, the cost of financing capital, was 8 to 9% in 20, uh, 2009. It's sometimes on the order of 4 to 5% now. With lower cost of capital, uh, you can build more competitive systems that are third-party financed, which means more people can have solar, which means the further explosion of the solar market, which is why we're very bullish on the market, and we think that um, the market will continue to expand in 2013 and 2014, and importantly, will continue to survive after the step down in the ITC, the investment tax credit from 2016 to 2017, from 30 percent to 10 percent. Uh, as Ethan uh, mentioned earlier on the slide there, there will be a decrease, I think, uh, we think, in the overall volume of systems uh, being built in the United States. But uh, solar's gone too far. We've come too far. Um, to, to be stopped at this point. Um, I think if anything that demonstrates that, it's the increased investment by utilities in solar. Utilities like Constellation, utilities like Exelon, Duke, PG&E. Uh, utilities like Southern Company that no one thought would be interested. Uh, utilities like Dominion. And so uh, we think the, the future of solar is bright. Uh, we, I, I wanted to point out one of the, the things that Elaine said earlier, which is when we compare ourselves to um, Germany, uh, costs uh, versus um, the actual um, purchase price of solar projects. Uh, those those um, graphs can be a little bit misleading. Uh, solar is being built in the United States on the residential side for about $3 a watt right now, if not less. Um, it's being purchased for $3 a watt, so it's being built for less. Um, and so I think uh, in the U.S., uh, companies are still innovating. I think we, on, on the... Um, our clients oftentimes on the other side of our business are the, the installers. We've seen huge, huge leaps in, in um, proficiency and expertise from them. Um, and so the future is bright. And that's what I would say about solar. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, so we're going to open it up for discussion in a minute, but I thought maybe I'd take a couple of the points that Yuri stopped on and, and sort of pose them to the panel more broadly. You know, typically when we when we encounter any particular technology issue, whether it's uh, something like solar that has traditionally not had a huge market share, but has always been something that there's lots of potential, lots of potential for scalability under, you know, sort of the certain right conditions, or something else, uh, other technology applications that we've dealt with in this forum. One of the key questions is, are we talking about a situation where support for that technology, the, the support we've seen, whether it's subsidy, whether it's R&D, whatever sort of support the, the technology has received to be able to scale up and to be able to reach that potential, whether we're talking about something where those support structures are changing, right? They could come from different places. So for example, you may not need as much direct subsidy in terms of the production side. You may not need as much direct subsidy in terms of the the, uh, the sort of installation or financing side. Uh, 
and or are we talking about something where we are envisioning a step change in the actual applicability of solar, right? Where we can look at a future where there's a great deal more solar. Like, so are we changing our expectations, right? So there's two sort of things going on when we think about sort of solar as a as a as a sort of technology in terms of its applications. One is. Uh, is, is the nature of how we're growing these markets, and then two is our expectation for what the art of the possible is. How do you think about both of those things, right? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of sort of the evolution of this technology. Well, you know, I, I have to say it's, it's been interesting to watch how markets have changed um, over time here in the United States. and. You know, basically what I've seen, and again, some of the big differences between what we've seen in, you know, foreign markets like Germany and, and here, um, even the variation from one state to another is that um, I think you're right that there are certain policies and um, regulatory regimes that have been um, more conducive to, to the market. But, you know, some of the evidence that we've seen is that what really matters in terms of um, the success of a solar market is just the duration of the policy that's in place. And so to a certain extent, you have to determine what your goals are, what, what it is that you want to achieve, and then you have to make a commitment to actually reaching those. And you know, for the most part, companies um, will come into that space, they'll learn to operate within it, and, um, and they will innovate so that they're successful. I think this technology, again, it's the, the pricing, um, the costs right now uh, for, for the technology itself are, um, sufficiently advanced and the technology is, is at a place where it, it's fully deployable. It's not, you know, something that we have to do a lot of research into. Um, that, you know, with, uh, with a little bit of certainty and commitment, there, there's absolutely no reason why you can't have great markets all across the U.S. and in, in other nations. Just uh, that we have a lot of, I mean, I guess the long story short, we have a lot of different solar markets in the United States, mm -hmm. which I think Elaine sort of alluded to, and a lot of different regimes, and Yuri, I could talk about this as well. And, um, you know, yeah, longevity, you know, classic, yes, matters a great deal. Um, and our, our general view, as it was sort of shown, is that we think that this stuff is becoming more and more cost competitive. So obviously, on the flip side, si subsidies become less and less competitive, less and less important, but uh, by no means have we sort of completely turned the corner where um, everywhere solar is cost competitive without um, without the support uh, uh, you know some kind of subsidy in some kind of way uh, if, from what I understand from your question I think you were asking whether or not you know there's two questions one what are the changes in terms of policy and two are there you know specific sort of deep technological changes that will take place I think both will take place I think um, the federal incentives for, for solar will um, start to ra ratchet down over time, as you guys know. Um, but I also think that with scale comes enormous amounts of investment, and that's what we're seeing right now. I mean, Solar City, I mentioned them earlier, so I these are $6 billion CapEx companies now, or not CapEx, market cap companies, market cap companies. That's a huge amount of money. They have resources uh, to build their, their, their businesses out, and I think they will, and I think a lot of that will come with the purchase of, um, like, Zep Solar, which is a, a module um, racking company that Solar City recently purchased, um, you know, investments in those types of technologies. Ethan, maybe just on uh, your your sort of overall outlook, you basically you know said you you guys are pretty bullish on what's possible uh, in terms of added uh, solar capacity. Uh, from what we said about two percent, about eighteen percent by twenty thirty. Um, so so within the solar community, I think that there's a lot of thinking about how to get to those kinds of growth rates, that kind of level. How do the people outside the solar industry look at the potential bullish nature of uh, of solar, the incorporation of solar. We've got another project series going on here called Electricity and Transition, which is just about what the heck is going on in the electricity sector in the United States across a variety of fronts. How, how does, and, and it doesn't have to be U.S. dependent, right? But like, how is that potential for solar to reach those kinds of levels, changing the way that people are thinking about the electricity or the energy market systems that they're being incorporated into? So it's, it's a good question. I mean, look, uh, it's a cliche, but this is this is truly disruptive technology, right? This is um, we we have a uh, we we built a electricity uh, system that is hub and spoke 
uh, that's been around for quite a while now and is centrally controlled uh, and um, with exceptions relatively manageable. Um, and the, the, just the sheer nature of distributed power, whether that's PV or maybe it's micro wind or other things, is um, that, that, that creates challenges. That's a change. Um, and uh, then throw in the fact that there's, um, that there's this sort of unpredictability about when you're going to get necessarily that, that juice out of those distributed systems. And that creates uh, further uncertainty. So uh, the, look, the, the answer is that and I think your program is great. And I think a lot of people are trying to think about this question of where the utility now fits in everything. And there's a lot of smart thinking and reconsideration going on. And then there's some people who are saying, well, I know where the utility fits. It's exactly where it's always fit. And this stuff is kind of a fad and it's going to come and go. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of people involved in the kind of constructive conversation about what happens next. And then there's some people who, frankly, just hope that things aren't going to change um, and or, 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 or feel strongly that things aren't going to, going to change. Our view is that they will because uh, the technology costs keep coming down. Um, and particularly in a global context, like I said, when you're talking about new markets where you're not talking about PV comp really competing against the cost of um, electricity that's coming into someone's house. You're talking about PV being the first power that comes to somebody's house or hut or whatever it is versus nothing. Uh, and that's a competition that increasingly photovoltaics is going to win because of the cost um, declines. So um, there's a lot of different reactions. I think this is part of a, a much larger kind of conversation that's going on around rethinking how electricity um, is delivered, consumed, and you know generated. Um, and obviously, the EPA rules in the U.S. are going to have an impact on that. But there's a it's a very interesting time, um, and, and it's not just because of renewables. Obviously, the the rise of natural gas and the implications of that um, are fundamentally shifting all of these things. And uh, this is one of the wild cards that's in, involved in that conversation. Yeah, to that point on the technology side, I mean, you know, when I talk to folks in our systems integration program, for example, they, they basically talk about, you know, the complexity that Ethan is referring to, which is, you know, what happens when you go from having, you know, these very centralized nodes where decisions are made to having not just one or two orders of magnitude, but, you know, several orders of magnitude more decision nodes that are, you know, involved in the system. And, um, you know, what's interesting about that question is, the, the kinds of decisions that need to be made in the policy and regulatory sphere about, you know, who gets to play and, um, you know, who gets what kinds of benefits from the role that they're playing there. And so, you know, I think that when you have the opportunity to have, you know, m a few orders of magnitude more players um, involved in this, you have a lot more stakeholders that you're taking into account. And I think that's, that's one of those things that, um, you know, the public is very interested in, in getting involved in that way. And I think that, that, that what that does and what we've seen in so many other industries is that it tends to benefit consumers um, because you are creating the potential for much more innovation by increasing the number of, of people who can get involved and be innovators and be part of that system. And so that, you know, I don't want to draw too, too many or, or too close of, a, of an analogy to, to other areas, but... Um, you know, we certainly have seen in general that when you have more competition in the market, when you create those additional opportunities for innovation, that in general, uh, consumers end up benefiting. Well, um, I'm not a huge expert in the innovation side of the solar, but, it, but I have, uh, you know, truly applauded some of the uh, things that Solar World's done in terms of uh, investing in R&D, uh, moving up its... Uh, panels to, you know, 280 watt and, and further. So uh, I guess, you know, broadly, having seen sort of the trade world, I, I think, you know, moving the innovations forward, uh, in uh, especially R&D, however you can create that platform, especially with the work you're doing, uh, I think it's extremely important, especially for, uh, you know, if you want to see this industry grow. So we have about 15 minutes left. I'd like to open up to sort of question and answer. Um, please uh, wait for a mic if you don't have one right in front of you or use the mic that you do have in front of you. Uh, state your name and affiliation and to the extent you can put your question in the form of a question. We always appreciate it. Okay, so we'll start right here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, my name is Sayed, and I'm from San Francisco Bay Area. I have a very small energy company, the system integrators. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had, uh, or we have now, is, uh, of course, financing. And uh, we could have done a lot better. I know all of uh, your company, uh, Solar City, of course, have done a great job. In California, the success is only for mega projects because they get the money somehow. But common people in California, Solar City is doing a good job, but it's not enough. And somehow, uh, we should have this opportunity for other smaller companies uh, to install uh, small systems and plus like solar farming project that some people have in farmer areas of uh, two acre lands or five acre lands and they want to have their own solar farm and sell it to the utility companies. They're not very successful in that because financing. And also, we have explored market and overseas market. There's a great potential for American-made products and because financing from through XCM is available from here. So how s some of you can help a small company like us, we do have very good connection in overseas for a very good project in private sectors. So I would like to know how I could utilize your ex expertise and experience to promote our business. Thank you very much. Maybe not company specific, but situation specific uh, advice sure. for people in that. So one, one um, program that we are supporting at the U.S. Department of Energy right now is um, a project that's called the Solar Access to Public Capital Working Group. And so that working group um, was originally led by um, some folks at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, but it's a big consortium of, I think, over 300 organizations now that include um, folks in the finance space, developers, um, you know, some of the big rating agencies, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of players in, in this space. And basically what they have done is they've, they've taken a look at um, you know, what it takes to really understand what a solar investment looks like, to really start to characterize what the risk for that looks like, um, and to develop standardized templates for things like contracts, um, you know, for PPAs, for leases, and to, to start to expand the baseline information, you know, about what, a, you know, what solar deployment um, characteristics look like. So that way we can start to have, you know, Better, uh, better products out there. Again, both in the forms of you know whether it's third-party finance systems, loans, insurance project uh, products, operations and maintenance maintenance type products, and things like this. And again, they have worked together to to try to aggregate a lot of information and best practices so that the finance community can better understand what you know a solar uh, product really looks like. Because I think to a certain extent you know, they can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, we don't know how risky this is, so we're just going to charge a high interest rate. And that can be, you know, very difficult. Or they can say, well, we're not really interested in this. It's too complicated. And so, you know, this is really an area where I think we've tried to play an important role in increasing that market transparency and help a number of players understand, you know, what's going on with this technology, what it really looks like in the field, and um, feel more comfortable with getting involved in that from a financial perspective. And hopefully, you know, that will benefit, you know, businesses across the U.S. by having greater access to, to that capital. Um, first, just a point of clarification. Um, my company's Soul Systems, not, um, not Solar City. We're for an innovative industry. We're not very innovative with our names. There's a lot of soul and solar going on, <laughs> full disclosure. Um, so my advice is just as a fellow entrepreneur, I would say, um, one, uh, when we began, we focused on a very specific part of the market. Um, that was called, there were these things called solar renewable energy credits that we built a whole business around. So uh, to the extent you want to work across markets, work on something that's very specific that you can build expertise in very quickly. My second point is maybe you don't want to work across markets. Maybe you want to work hyper-local. And I think that's a really good strategy right now because origination of solar assets is the, is the king in solar, the solar industry right now. With all this source of cheap capital, there's a huge search for good projects. So if you can lev leverage, uh, leverage your, your local connections and your relationships, I'd highly recommend it. I think that's where to go, um, whether it's your, your friend that owns a store nearby or someone that you know or whatever. My third piece is that if you don't want to stay in the United States and you want to go abroad, I think your best bet is probably to utilize uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC. 
Um, they've done tremendous work in the solar industry, uh, working with U.S. investors that are investing abroad. Is a bridge between one country and another. I think you have a, a good advantage there. Um, the Import-Export Bank is the other one that you would use if you were utilizing equipment in the United States. But my guess is that you don't want to rely on equipment in the United States at this point unless you have some sort of competitive advantage. Okay, we're going to run short on time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three questions, okay? So please try and keep them brief so we can get them all in. We've got two over on the, the wall over here, and then you, sir, in the blue shirt, okay? Okay, thanks. Julia Piper with uh, Climate Wire, part of E&E News. I wonder if you can address uh, the what's going to happen with disposing of these panels, the materials in them. I understand they have long life mm -hmm. times, but what's going to happen there? And addressing climate change, low-carbon energy, is there potentially another environmental issue being created? Hi, as mentioned before, uh, China will be, uh, China will be the, uh, a biggest market for solar. And, and my question will be, we talk a lot about uh, the trade issue between U.S. and China, but is there any room for uh, American company to, to do uh, business in Chinese solar market and there uh, any opportunity for cooperation, especially in distributed solar generation in China? Because we said uh, 14 gigawatt goes for this year, but uh, and the 60 of it will come from uh, distributed solar generation, but as a report, none of the uh, solar uh, distributed solar ge uh, generation installed in the first call that this year. So, yeah, what's your opinion? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Amit Ronan from George Washington University. Uh, as we mentioned, solar is booming, but my sense is that it's largely out of the, what could be characterized as the early adopter market. So they're people who are, have the means to uh, typically more affluent households that are able to afford solar upfront now or they're single homeowners. So wondering what the panelists think about the strategies and policies that are necessary if we're gonna get to 18% penetration rates by 2030. There's been estimates that say roughly one in 10 Americans are able to put solar panels on their own homes because they have a roof that's suitable, uh, they have the money, they're not renters, they're not uh, low-income people, they don't live in multifamily units. So uh, interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Thank you. And maybe what we'll do is we want to start with Ethan, and you can address the component pieces of, uh, of a couple of those that you want to, and then we'll kind of go down the line. Yeah, I'm trying to make sure I got all of them down. Uh, okay, well, maybe the first one I'll, I'll address uh, first because, frankly, it's the thing I know least about um, and, and don't have a good answer on. But it's a very good question given the, the kind of volumes that we're projecting. Um, we do, you know, we do generally assume a 20, 25-year life uh, uh, cycle for these systems. But you're right. Um, once that, um, you know, once those systems start to need to be retired, there's a, there's a, there's a real question of what happens next, and I don't know the answer at this point. Um, the China question is a really interesting one, um, and just to give a little background, more background on China, as I mentioned earlier, really, you know, has has been for several years the largest manufacturer of photovoltaics, but then last year was the largest demand market for photovoltaics. And, uh, but the vast majority of the new projects that got built over there were large-scale projects. And, and as was noted, there's very ambitious goals now over there to do distributed solar. Um, and frankly, that's, um, that's more challenging because um, it requires, you know, individual systems being put on individual roofs or in backyards or wherever it is. It involves a lot of individual transactions that have to take place. And it's a very good point about perhaps there is an opportunity to, to share knowledge. I know the DOE has been involved in a U.S.-China cooperation program for some years now, and, I, and frankly, I don't know if those are one of the things that, that they've been talking about, probably should, um, but I think that's definitely um, an area um, uh, of potential cooperation. And then last to meet, I think I got your question, which is about opportunities for solar for, um, for lower income um, residents. Um, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I would say that you know, we're crossing over to a, a, a period where, um, you know, it, if you're in the right market, it can, like I said, showed on our chart, on, from a, you know, you can reach grid, you could be a so-called grid uh, or socket parity, you know, right now. But uh, that still means you need 15 or 20 grand to get the system up on your roof. Um, and, and part of what you know, Yuri's doing and what others, Solar City and others are doing are trying to 
make financing more available. Um, and I think some of it's starting to happen. I mean, I, I always find fascinating when I go out to California, um, which is that there is a living and breathing solar market out there. And you turn on the radio, and there are ads. And those are not aimed you know, at just high-end consumers. Obviously, everybody listens to the radio. There are billboards. It's, it's a market that's trying to get to that. Um, but I will say that, you know, at least um, in the past, when we've looked at the demographics of who the adopters are, it's typically been more Palo Alto than it is, I guess, East Palo Alto. I don't, I don't know my geography that great out there. But it's been, it's, it's been more skewed more towards the higher end. But that's definitely starting to shift uh, to some degree. Sure. So um, on the disclosure of uh, materials, I should say that, you know, we have tremendous amount of resources that we put into our national laboratories, um, and they're doing a lot of work on um, testing what's, you know, testing what's being fielded. Um, we have a qualification plus program that we put together. And um, in general, when you look at uh, most solar panels that are being sold today, they're, you know, they're made of glass, silicon, silver. These are, these are things that I don't think we have to worry too much about. And I just look at the car industry. Um, it's one of the largest recycling industries out there. So um, you know, I, I think that at some point when these things start to reach their end of life that uh, we'll certainly see some, some industries popping up around all of that. And I also know that there are a number of manufacturers who have take back programs basically where um, they, they will bring back modules, whether it's a faulty one you know, or one that's reached already reached its, its end of life and that they um, are looking at incorporating those costs um, to a certain extent. And so um, I'd say that that's, that's something that, you know, we're, we're thinking about, we're addressing, and that, you know, we'll continue to be addressing, you know, over the coming years. Um, on, on number two, on the distributed energy in China, um, we do have some, some programs where we're working with um, a couple of, of um, cities in, in China that I'm aware of, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy International Office has, has a specific grant where they're doing some work on that. Um, but yeah, I agree. We, we certainly have uh, taken a look at some of the soft costs. And in fact, uh, I think one of my analysts was there just in this past month um, taking a look at how deployment is happening in China and really trying to understand that. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just going to say I agree, I guess. Um, and then on, on uh, Mead's point, I feel like he's throwing me a softball question here because he knows how fond I am of community and shared solar projects. Um, and also that uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm doing some work um, in conjunction with uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, um, to help meet uh, the President's Climate Action Plan goal of getting 100 megawatts of solar deployed on federally assisted housing. And so um, those are all things that, yeah, I think are, are really interesting areas of opportunity. Um, Denver Housing Authority, I think, uh, recently did like 660 units of low-income housing. Uh, you know, it was a couple megawatts or something, and I think they did it in less than two years, which is really exciting um, from, from my standpoint. And so, yeah, in the business innovation space, uh, I definitely feel like increasing access is, is really important. There, there are people who are trying to figure it out. We see people in the finance space who are interested in it. And, Frankly, those are folks who are used to doing complex deals and are willing to take on some risk. Um, and so I feel like all the conversations I've had with folks in the low-income space have been really, really positive. Um, if, if anything, they, uh, they're people who really want to get things done, and they will figure out how to do it. So yeah, it's been great. Um, pollution and solar panels. Uh, first, I agree with Elaine. I think as the industry uh, matures, recycling programs will grow. We've heard of a couple already, and many of our investors actually have a disposal fee at the end of the uh, project's life in anticipation of actually taking those panels and doing something with them. Uh, so people are thinking about these things, and I think people will do something about them. Can U.S. businesses work in China? I think was your question, as I understood it. The answer is yes. Uh, Sun Power, one of the largest U.S. businesses in solar right now, I think it's a $5 billion market cap, uh, is actively working in a JV in China as we speak. I'm sure we'll see others move into that space as well. It's an industry that's going to explode. It's exploding now. Um, and then finally, the strategies for getting to 18 um, percent. I think the bottom line is that uh, the lower income folks in the United States that want solar either can't afford it or don't have the credit to get financed, right, or don't own their home. And what Elaine was pointing out is that solar is becoming um, effectively a commodity that you can sell in markets um, through virtual net metering um, local legislation, or even if you wanted to, you could sell it through um, regional transmission organizations like PJM um, on, the, on the grid. You just can't sell it at the same price. So you can do that now. Um, and I think the ability to turn solar energy into a commodity that people can actively buy, uh, trade, et cetera, uh, is one of the innovations we haven't seen yet, but will emerge in the next five years. And we're seeing parts of it. Um, certainly in DC, for example, there's legislation that will enable uh, people, homeowners, to buy solar from projects that are outside of their, their home. 
Um, and so I think that's a big innovation. It's, it's an important one. Uh, great, not a whole lot to add to uh, the austere uh, comments of the, my fellow panelists here, but you know, obviously the issue of disposal and uh, recycling is one that standards will be built around as time goes on. That's just an important thing that the U.S. government does through uh, its own ITACs and other uh, groups. Um, in terms of opportunities for U.S. companies to operate in China, I truly hope that does expand. Uh, I know there was an uh, enormous project that First Solar was trying to do in Mongolia, uh, one of the biggest uh, ever in the Mongolia region uh, that uh, was under China. Uh, it had fell through. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I certainly hope uh, non-tariff barriers don't uh, become a factor inhibiting uh, U.S. companies from being able to operate there. Um, in terms of ex expanding, uh, uh, solar to more rooftops. You know, I'm not the great technical expert that these folks are, but uh, again, it's always innovation, and uh, I truly believe that uh, one of the biggest factors of innovation is uh, innovation that happens on the shop floor. So manufacturing uh, uh, ties in innovation and uh, brings long-term benefits that you never even know uh, were going to happen, like the Intel story. So thanks. No, I, I don't think I have too much to add. I, I, the only, I did want to just make one, um, for, I don't know if we're closing, I wanted to add, just want to add a little bit of one counterpoint on the trade issue because I think it is so important and, and it is so complex, at least in my view. And, that, and, um, uh, and, and there are a lot of nuances to it. And I mean, one of the things I did want to just say is that I mean, uh, we've tracked the, the solar industry globally for 10 years and what happened over the last five years, frankly, I think was more complex than any one market um, sort of proactively planning to flood another. What happened was the market became vastly over capacity. And so what we had was a lot of different players in a lot of countries sort of desperate to sell everything that they had that they were producing into any market. Um, now, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know if that rep if whether, what, what that represents in terms of the question of, of dumping or countervailing, but I do think that's important to note is that there was a, that we, we really went for, through a very tough period for, for solar equipment manufacturers. And this is not uncommon with new industries where you see kind of boom bust cycles or the industry kind of gets ahead of itself and builds more capacity than it's needed. We're starting to come back towards equilibrium now. We're starting to see manufacturers who frankly won't you know, won't produce unless they can make a margin um, on a global market. And so I think that I just wanted to add that one sort of um, piece of clarification uh, on that point. I think the other thing is to keep in mind is on sort of the economic implications for the U.S. in the short run and the long run, I think are really, really interesting. I think there's, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of folks in this country who are now involved very actively in installing. And I think if you, a lot of them, if you were to ask them, just want to get their hands on the cheapest equipment that they can because they think that will give them the greatest opportunity to s install the most. Uh, and I think there's an argument to be made from the environmental perspective that that's what's best for the planet is to try and get as much zero carbon energy out there um, as we can. But now I, I think on the, on the flip side, as I mentioned earlier, I think in the long run, we're going towards a much larger global market. And the question is, do we want to create systems whereby we create um, little fiefdoms where every country has an opportunity and maybe some protections to build their own manufacturing capacity um, so that they can be part of that literally larger pie that I showed uh, a bit earlier. So I just wanted to add that my only two cents on it because um, it is such an interesting topic and it is a complex one and there's many different ways to kind of look at this. Well, listen, one of the things that uh, hopefully keeps people coming back is that we allow you to leave on time. I just wanted to say, you know, aside from all of these wonderful sort of market and technical insights which and, and policy relevant insights, I was telling these guys before the session, you know something's happening when all of a sudden people are walking into your offices with a, a sort of an iPad case that is, you know, powered by solar. Or on my camping trip coming up with my family, I have numerous sort of solar power generation applications when I go to REI to buy all of our gear, right? And it's not, you know, that's not a tremendously powerful intellectual insight, but it does do something about sort of the socialization of solar and the and the the sort of the reachability of it in, into various uh, aspects of your daily life. So that's my my sort of non-technical uh, uh, contribution to the conversation. I just wanted to thank all of you very much for spending your morning with us and telling us about uh, what you're doing and helping us understand what's actually happening out there on sort of the frontier of solar. Uh, I think we all know a lot more about it now than when we started, and hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep uh, looking for ways to explore it going forward. So thank you very much for joining us.
If you need any help in Denmark, let us know.